I'm your host, Kaylee, and this is Rebel Wellness. You've just tuned in to Rebel Wellness, the podcast that's here to revolutionize your approach to personal health and well-being. I'm your host, Kaylee, also known as Coach Kales, and I'm thrilled to have you join our Rebel community. In a world that's saturated with fleeting diet trends and unrealistic beauty standards, we believe it's time for serious change. Our mission is simple yet profound, to empower women like you to break free from the confines of today's diet culture and embrace a holistic approach to health that's sustainable for the long haul. If you're like me, you're here to embrace the concept that true well-being encompasses every facet of your life, mind, body, and soul. Rebels believe in aligning our journey with our individual needs and values because a one-size-fits-all approach just simply doesn't cut it anymore. This podcast is your safe space to explore the depths of wellness guided by myself, experts, real life stories, and genuine commitment to your growth. You're here to begin your transformative journey, and it's time to discover your own version of balance in your health. Every week when you tune into Rebel Wellness, we'll learn, grow, and rebel against the polarizing outdated norms to finally achieve lasting vitality and joy. Because that sounds pretty great, right? Your journey starts now, and I am so excited that you're here. Welcome back, Rebel, to yet another Rebel Wellness podcast episode. Today is a really great topic, so I hope you find the uh, space to sit all the way through it, because I guarantee a lot of what I talk about today is going to be really beneficial for you as you continue to navigate the wellness world on social media and just in life in general. You know, we don't really look at magazine covers and stuff anymore as much, so it's not as applicable, but taking a lot of the way that even just magazine covers used to influence us, today's topic, I'm just going to get right into it uh, and let you know that we are going to be talking about the kind of navigating the wellness space on social media and I'm going to equip you with a lot of good tools for sifting through the BS as you kind of navigate around on different platforms, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, whatever you call it. There's a lot of really important stuff that from my professional experience, which is over a decade now, honestly, more like 15 years being a part of the professional space in regards to nutrition and fitness and such. I really think that this topic needs to be had in the beginning of this year because we want to start 2024 as a true rebel really avoiding and dodging (laughs) swerving whatever you want to say all of the the bullshit honestly I can't sugarcoat it I have to just say the words because (laughs) there is so much guys I don't even know how to put my passion into words other than the tone of my voice (laughs) and the topic and the different points that we're going to chat about today. So I'm going to give you my top eight things that you can think about and utilize. Again, like I said, have in your toolkit for better navigating the space. And if you think you know somebody who is like, if you have a bestie who's constantly like, this person just said this, we're going to do that. Oh my God, this other person said this. I think we have to do this now. Send this episode to them because I think it should be very helpful for everyone, especially us females, because a lot of diet culture is marketed towards us. And a lot of the time, our value and worth and interest is in anything that can hack or optimize our health or physique. And so I think that we need to be a lot stronger a lot more prepared, a lot more educated, because that's how we become more empowered to change a lot of the narratives that are just so stereotypical and that we tend to fall for. And the billion dollar interest, in, this might be actually trillion dollars now with the uh, introduction of Ozempic and semaglutides in general. We need to <laughs> stick it to the man a little bit with this one um, because we really should try to break away from the stereotypes for sure. So overall, I want you to make sure you understand that my intention is to provide you with my professional experience and thoughts, tips, et cetera, for navigating this wellness space on social media more effectively. And I think it's extremely important that you always aim to find trustworthy sources for your wellness guidance because your health is one of the most important things that you have power over. Your individual health is directly your choices 
physicalized. <laughs> That's not the word. I don't, I'm, I'm like my brain, everybody who's talked to me the last week knows that like my brain is coming out of holiday mode and words are so hard to access right now, but we're going to make it a new word and everything that your choices combine into becomes your physicality. Maybe that's the word I'm thinking of. <laughs> Somebody else is listening being like, she means this. Tell me what I mean. <laughs> but anyways, I think it's really important that you take full responsibility and control over your health. I would say if there's something you can do as a New Year's intention for 2024, it would to be to stop falling for a lot of these little quick fixes or hacks or quote unquote, if they don't truly align with your health, if your experience doesn't become better just because you're doing the status quo of the moment. And I think if there's anything that TikTok has influenced the most, it's that things move so get and fast. Like they are like one week, it's this next week, it's this. Sometimes it's like one day, it's this. And then two days later, it's this. And that's, in my opinion, dangerous when it comes to health. So like health talk is kind of dangerous. There's some interesting things, but gosh, guys, the amount of like straight baloney that clients will like tell me, or I see them starting to do. And I'm like, what the F are you doing? <laughs> Why are you doing this? This is going to derail your progress and or distract you from actually establishing the foundational habits that actually do make an impact in the long term for what you really want, the body you really want, the health you really want, you know, the skin you really want. Following trends is is bad for those things. And so um, all, all that to say, it's really important to find your trustworthy sources. And I'm going to teach you in eight different points today how to do that and how to be more skilled with sifting through the BS on social media. Okay. So I hope you really enjoy this. Stay all the way through for the best ones there towards the end. Some things that you may have never known that is like totally kind of just right behind the gate for a lot of us professionals. We deal with it like all the time, especially if we're the kind of professional that cares about up-to-date science and studies and interpreting them, yada, yada. I promise I will not make that section boring for you, or I'll try my best not to because I know a lot of people are like, eh, I don't really want to do anything more than read the title or something like that, or have somebody who seems like a professional read the title. So we're going to talk more about that. Um, but real quick, usual housekeeping. Come join us on our social media community at Kaylee Loren. You can find links in the show notes. Definitely check out the show notes all the time. Um, they always have timestamps that are important if you want to go back to things or all of the affiliate links and or my social media links. You can also join the Rebel Wellness Podcast community. It, she's small, but she's growing. <laughs> and that's at Rebel Wellness Podcast. And the last thing I'll say is definitely come join um, my newsletter coachkales.com. There's a bajillion different links. There's also my first ever digital course is launching. It's a DIY course and everybody who signs up this month via the link on um, the specific courses page, online courses page, you will get access to a reduced exclusive rate specifically just for my newsletter group who signed up there, who's on the wait list. So that page will also be linked in the show notes and smack on my website. So coachkales.com, go check that out. If that's something that's interesting to you, um, you might actually want to know what the digital course is. <laughs> it's um, I, it's called Flexible Food Foundations and it's I've gathered 10 years of coaching and experience and nutrition expertise into what I have found to be the foundational things that everyone should master and well understand and practice to absolutely change their life for the long term to break free from the diet culture and to better understand what makes a food nourishing or not nourishing <laughs> like less nourishing or more of like a treat because it's all about balance and what i really want and love to teach people is how they can actually access more of that flexibility through the food they eat and i guys i've stayed the same exact weight in a healthy body for the last four years following all of these tips and information that I'm teaching in this course. So I really wanted to make it accessible to way more people than just my clients. So that was the birthing of Flexible Food Foundations and it's going to be launching in February. So you want to get your name on that wait list. So again, check it out, coachkales.com if that is something you are interested in. All right, let's dive into the episode. All right, so first I have to say before we get into this first tip is 
I feel you. It is so confusing to be on the wellness space on social media altogether. Like, no joke. It is... <laughs> It is so much. It is so much. Like sometimes I will get into like a little rabbit hole as we all do, but I don't scroll very often. I've kind of really held really strong boundaries against scrolling more than maybe 10 minutes. And I'm kind of weird. I don't do that very often. I probably scroll for maybe 10 minutes, uh, like every several days or so. Um, just because my brain has way too much I'm juggling right now. But uh, not to say that yours doesn't. I just have found that when I do more than that and too frequently, it becomes not only a waste of my like kind of precious time that I know thinking about nothing would be more valuable than thinking about something, <laughs> but also the fact that... Um, there is so much to be said about the neuroscience behind over over information and overstimulation. And unfortunately, especially like the way that TikTok is built, it is constant. It's like, what was that comedian who made the uh, everything all at once all the time? Yeah. And that's like literally what it is now. And it's too much. And our brains, like, it's not surprising. A lot of people are struggling with more ADHD presenting symptoms now because we are untraining our brain to be able to focus. That's a real science thing. That's not just like an anecdotal thought. And if you are thinking like, I've never realized that before, maybe I should scroll it back, <laughs> literally scroll it back or look into it a little bit more. There's some great stuff on that. I know Huberman and several other big scientists who are experts in neuroscience have a lot of interesting stuff on it. But at the same time, it is just kind of when you think about it, makes a lot of sense because if like Buddhists, when they are monks, rather, when they're practicing to become enlightened, a lot of their practice is being able to focus, to rein in their focus, like meditation. You know, if you've ever tried meditation before, <laughs> you'll realize that it is so goddamn hard to not like wander off and think about like, what am I going to do later today? What's on my grocery list? Oh, I need to go pick that up. You know what I mean? It's so hard. And like, Focus is the ability to not think about other things at the same time. And that's why I really like meditative like hobbies, like um, bouldering for me is a big one because all I have to think about is the next hold on the wall. I can't think about anything else or else I'm going to get too exhausted on the wall and like not be able to complete the climb. So things like that can be important for you if you are somebody who is struggling with focus and inevitably social media will train you to be semi-neurodivergent in the way that like your brain just cannot focus. It's not something that is a issue necessarily with a lot of people, like people who are born actually like more ADHD, but it is a thing that's confusing people. Like I've had so many clients, especially as ADHD diagnoses ads were all over social media, like 2020, 2021. I don't know if you noticed that yourself or not, but I was getting like so many clients randomly being like, I need to go get tested. I think I'm ADHD. And I'm like, I think you just haven't practiced not being distracted constantly, you know, like not having your phone scrolling in all of your open free space, your white space in your calendar should not just be filled with information overload from all these social medias. And I'm going to get off my soapbox, but it's an important soapbox to start this chat with because I also think that it's going to correlate to something I'm going to say towards the end of today's chat. Um, but I do want you to think about that. And I don't want you to think that I'm judging you because I'm totally not. I just have massively observed it with a lot of my clients. And I know that it is a game changer when they start to disconnect from that. <laughs> I know a lot of social media is going to be mad. I'm yet another person who is talking about that concept because they make their money by you being on the app. You know, that's why they push notification. You're like, hey, this random ass person is just posted something. Maybe you want to see it. You know what I mean? It's like, that's how I know that I've been doing well at not being on the app is I start to get these like really extra reaching posts uh, or push notifications from like Instagram and Facebook and stuff because it's like, hey, come back. Maybe this will interest you. You know, can I interest you? Oh, well, that's what he said, isn't it? Can I interest you on um, everything all at once, all the time? Anyways, so first tip and or concept I'd like to talk to you about is how you can kind of identify a trustworthy source. So this is a little tricky and it's not always as like straightforward as what I'm going to say today, but it definitely a lot of things will be made more clear through this concept. So a person for health advice, and I will remind you this entire thing I'm talking about today is specifically for social media health advice. They need to have some level of professional education and a like transparent online presence. 
So if they do not show any accreditations or qualifications, or you go to their website and there's nothing about their about me other than like, I was a corporate pencil pusher and then I changed my life by becoming a full-time online fitness coach. And then it's like, okay, but then like, what did you do to become a fitness coach? Like, did you just take your hobby of liking fitness and then turn it into a business because you're cute and the stereotypical vibe of what gets people to think you're healthy, you must know what you're doing. You're all lean and stuff. And then they don't have any transparency about like what makes them qualified other than like, I just became a coach because I liked it as my side gig. And then I managed to do well marketing myself and advertising and selling programs and shakes and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the drill. That's a red flag. So red flags that I would say to look out for when trying to identify a trustworthy source is like spammy content. Like all they're doing is constantly pushing programs they're selling or different things are involved in like shakes or something like that, like shakeology and all that junk. Um, If they're a beach coach, beach body coach or whatever, red flag, they don't have to do anything to become a beach body coach. It's literally just one of those um, pyramid scheme type things, unfortunately. And I'm sorry if you were involved with that and you're like, no, it wasn't. I mean, technically, yes, it was this. (laughs) It's all multi-level marketing groups. Doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. It just means that like you're just kind of a person who is put out there to believe you could have (laughs) autonomy over your business and selling other people's products. But like we saw, like what happened in the pandemic with several big MLM companies, um, cause I had a friend that was directly in it and he was one of their like top level high earners, multiple six figures. The moment they had to close and, and file bankruptcy and cut all everything, everybody else who was below them as quote unquote entrepreneurs selling their products were screwed. They all lost everything. They couldn't get any more because they weren't producing any more products for them. And he literally had to move to a different state to afford his family because he had a new wife, kid, and a pregnancy. And that like sucks, right? That's scary. So I would just say that like people, sorry, I guess they went on a tangent with that one, but it is one of those things that just kind of shows you that you don't really want to follow or become a part of MLM stuff. And if people are pushing a lot of that on their content, there's not a lot of insurance that they will be doing what they're doing for very long because oftentimes 99% of the time they drop out of whatever they're doing. It's kind of a hobby thing. It's kind of a, they saw the sparkles of selling this stuff and making commissions on it. And then they're going to like quit on you in a few years because they realize that like, oh, this stuff actually either the company goes under or (laughs) this or that. So those types of people, frankly, for me, I personally don't follow them at all. Not that they're bad people. It's just that they're not necessarily going to be trustworthy sources for health stuff because typically people who sell a lot of those different MLM company products like Arbonne, which is like skincare and nutrition and makeup and all that stuff, they most likely are getting their health information and stuff from sales intro meetings and such in when they join the MLM company and then they don't actually have a lot of background knowledge on their own usually again that's why I mean check and see if they have any other qualifiers like they did go to school for nutrition or they did go to school for fitness aka kinesiology or biomechanics or anatomy and physiology and that would give you a better sense of oh, maybe they're a person who does have all this knowledge, but they're just on the side trying to sell this MLM stuff. This MLM thing is really important to talk about. That's why I'm talking about it right now, because it is one of the easiest ways for people to get kind of scammed into thinking a person is a credible health voice or platform. And in reality, um, it's not. So other MLMs to be looking out for is like Herbalife, Forever Living, Nikan, Juice Plus, Amway, Zinzino. You know, there's like so many isogenics, shakely. Yeah. Those are the ones that come to mind that are very (laughs) MLM-y. Not very. They are just because by nature, that is what they are. So if you see people doing that, or if immediately when you follow them, they get slid into your DMs and be like, Hey girl, or Hey bestie and blah, blah, blah. And they chat you up. And then all of a sudden they're like, I think you'd be a really good person for this product. Eh, That's a run. Sorry, that's a run. It's normal and good for people to reach out and be like, hey, thanks for the follow or whatever. Like I do that every once in a while. But if they do that and they follow with a, you should buy this product or something like that, that's usually a big red flag for me because they're just doing the things to make the sales, which, you know, a large majority of social media businesses are. But at the same time, it's kind of like, 
I don't know if you have my best interest in mind, actually. So then along with that is excessive affiliates. You know, they just are constantly posting things for affiliates and they lack formal credentials. So you want to be making sure you can identify trustworthy sources by background checking them, see where they have qualifiers. Don't just look at follower counts. So that brings me into concept number two, follower count versus authority. A higher follower count does not necessarily equate to expertise. It hardly ever does, usually. Um, I know this because recently I got to do my first big paid speaking gig for a very large company, and it, I was a, a health voice speaking on actually fitness <laughs> this time. And I learned that they searched through like over 40 people that they're dominatingly a female team, they had all been like, I follow this fitness chick, I follow this fitness chick, this one looks good. And all of them had like 100,000 or more up to a million followers. And corporate wouldn't approve any of them because they didn't have any qualifications, not even like on their LinkedIn. So they weren't qualified at all. Because like, why would you have a big platform, have like a degree and other certifications and not put it out in the public? unless you were somebody who is kind of just a hobbyist who got a lot of followers, most likely because of their body or personality or lifestyle. Wealth usually is involved in that. And you can kind of bypass that because people look at you, they want the life you have, or they think they can access it by following you. And then they kind of naturally assume, we've all done it, you know, naturally assume that they are an expert or have expertise in health or whatever, because it looks like obviously they've got it down, you know, this or that. No, unfortunately, it does matter whether or not they have a background because there's so many nuanced things to nutrition and fitness that you really want somebody who is qualified to do it more than they're popular. And a lot of the times the people who are super popular pay other people who do actually have qualifications to either teach them or to train them. So a lot of times their body isn't that way because they did it themselves. It's because they paid a professional trainer to train them. So there's so much smoke and mirrors when it comes to especially fitness, fitness more than nutrition, honestly, that you guys have to be aware of because a no joke, a lot of fitness influencers, despite if they bodybuild or not. And again, bodybuilding competition, having competed in a bodybuilding competition does not give you any expertise other than you know how to diet hard and kind of push over your food voice telling you, girl, you need to eat. You're getting unhealthy. Even though we tend to think a really tight and lean body is a healthy body, it is not. The lower you get under 18% body fat as a female, the less healthy you actually get. So this is just a fact. You lose your period. Once you lose your period, your health is going down the hill because that is a sign of optimal health, optimal hormone function. And if you don't have that anymore, things are going towards not good. And it's usually a lot of deficits or deficiencies rather and a deficit in calories, and your body fat percentage is so low that you cannot produce hormones properly. A lot of these uh, bodybuilding competitors tend to see hair loss and brittle nails, bad skin, you know, tons of stuff that they, that's why they cover up and put on a ton of makeup and spray tan and all the stuff to make their muscles pop. Needless to say, it is not a qualifier of healthiness and or expertise. I know so many people that started selling nutrition and fitness <laughs> programs just because they did one or two bodybuilding competitions and they did not even bother to get a personal training certification or any other types of certifications to at least help them better understand why their original coach, because they paid somebody else to get them like that, why they got that way from it. So do not just think that because somebody did a bodybuilding competition and got really lean once that they have any level of expertise to take care of your health, because unless you're going to do bodybuilding, which go listen to my bodybuilding episode if you are considering that before you do it. Um, it's not necessarily a good person to follow for you if you're a general health, general population person who's just looking to feel their best, look better, and exist in life longer, you know? <laughs> so make sure that you don't just look at how popular they are because they tend to just follow and copy other people that seem experts in that field to them. I have seen so many countless posts, again, usually that clients will send me, where some chick who has a huge following saw that like this one person said this or that about cycle syncing or cycle tracking and that you can gain fat if you work out too hard at this day of your cycle 
And that is just not true. There's a lot of nuance to it. And then only people who have a background in understanding anatomy and physiology, as well as the um, reproductive system and how hormones and things impact your body and how different people have different cycles. Some people have pretty unhealthy cycles, like really bad cramping, lots of bleeding, headaches, migraines, nausea, you know, those are signs that there's a hormonal imbalance. That shouldn't be, that's not normal. So even though it's common, it's not normal. And those people could have a worse time where maybe more cortisol being pumped into their system by doing too intensive a workout in their luteal phase could maybe encourage fat gain, but it usually wouldn't be for a large majority of people who have standard cycles, like some cramping, three to five days of bleeding, not too much else symptoms, you know, those people are going to be fine working out in the luteal phase. Like I personally have never had an issue when I work out when my cycle is healthy at that latter part of my cycle. I actually usually hit some good PRs on my period and I joke about it. I call it my period PRs because you can actually lift like really heavy and slow with longer rest periods uh, right on your cycle. So there's a lot of things, again, if you don't have any background in understanding the body to a science or nuances from actually working with hundreds of clients in real life, you won't know that what you're saying is not always true. And then those people with high follower accounts tend to say those things and confuse everybody else. And it's super annoying. <laughs> and you'll usually get a lot of actual experts commenting in the comments being like, uh, not always true or definitely not true, you know? And, um, and then it's hard for people to like sift through it because then that person who has a lot of followers tends to snarkily comment back. And then all of their followers who are big fans of the person with a lot of followers, just like kind of jump on that post and like back up the person they're following. And then it makes it confusing for you as another viewer to be like, uh, who's right in this situation? You know what I mean? <laughs> and so anyways, those are like real things that happen. So that's why I'm kind of talking about it. That brings me also to a next concept that book, book publishing and credentials don't necessarily mean credibility or expertise either. And I know this is scary. This is kind of opening up the world to being like, is anything real anymore? I know, I feel you. Again, that's why I said that that's why we're talking about this today, that it is a really confusing smoke and mirrors kind of world now because everybody has access to doing what used to be pretty challenging and prestigious, such as book publishing. So it used to be long-term in the back, and this was all told to me by a client of mine who was a publisher and editor for books for like 40 years in his lifetime, that you don't get the clout as much anymore of getting published by a publishing house like it used to be because publishing houses mean that they would fact check things, they would grammatically check things, they would remove things that are actually not true, you know, yada yada. Now, unfortunately, depending on how much money you have, you can publish your own book and it can look as professional AF as you want. And that is a little dangerous because now people can publish a bunch of malarkey in a book and make it look legit and not have specific citations that give you a better understanding of their credibility, expertise, etc. And so if you don't, if you get a book from somebody about health stuff and it doesn't cite very much and it doesn't have other experts involved in the writing of the book or whatnot, um, and they published it themselves, odds are very, very strong that this is kind of anecdotal information. It's just to the individual. And so you kind of have to fact check and read through a lot of the reviews, as long as they're not paid reviews and stuff, or they don't seem like overly fluffy all the time, <laughs> like just big fangirls, like constantly being like, this is an amazing book. And they didn't really even read it. They're just trying to help their girl get on like the New York Times bestseller list. Those are things to look out for. And so I know so many people, especially clients in the past have been like, well, this person published this book and she's an RN and this or that. And I'm like, well, did she get it like fact checked? Was it published by like a publishing house? Like, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it was like this diet that I'm not going to dive into it, but it's just a ridiculous diet that I'm like, no, <laughs> that is the road to deficiencies. Um, so you got to be very careful. You got to be very careful 
who you follow just because they publish a book, because I could publish a book right now. And maybe in the future I will, but I will probably take the time if it is scientific based or something like that to get it backed by other people who have the credentials and have a better expertise to make sure that it's legit. So be very careful about that. It is a very common misconception because unfortunately in the last like 20 years, anyone can publish a book on their own now. And that just sucks because <laughs> it does not, it no longer guarantees credibility anymore. So the next concept is limitations of medical education. This is a controversial topic. So just sit with me here for a second and have an open mind because again, this is something that I get to see because of where I've been, who I've worked amongst, different symposiums and conferences I've been to, and also having trained a lot of medical professionals and such. Unfortunately, the traditional medical education system tends to lack depth in nutritional science. More often than not, absolutely lacks depth in nutritional science. We're speaking more about standard medical doctors and nurses. I, I know this because I have fact-checked it out of curiosity with not only several of my friends who actually are doctors now, but also easily 30 nurses that I've trained over the years. It's not part of their curriculum because they have a lot of other stuff that they have to focus on and that is important in the standard Western medicine education system. And a lot of people who have gone the Western medicine route and then went towards more functional medicine have talked about this a lot on their own platforms about how they were disappointed by the lack of depth in nutritional science and or just human alternative medicine. And it's not necessarily alternative in a way that it doesn't work or is phony. It's alternative in the way that it's just not what is standardly taught in the Western medical education system. And this is tricky because there's a lot of, again, like nuance to better understanding how to deduce if this person who has MD or PhD behind their name is also just limited by their physical education in schooling or through practice, but not in field evidence. So there's kind of a difference between like science-based and science-backed, and then also how does it actually play out in the general population day to day? Because as we know, a lot of people are very unique, you know, a lot of females especially are very unique, especially as we have more and more metabolic disease coming up with our lifestyles and the chemicals and everything going on. There's a lot of education in the standard system that is not advanced up towards these nuances. It doesn't care about that necessarily because unfortunately, a lot of it is influenced by big pharma nowadays. And that's not in a conspiracy way. That's actually just legitimately who has big fingers in what curriculum is taught to a lot of doctors and nurses now, because a lot of Healthcare in the U.S. is unfortunately based around pharmaceuticals. That's just legit. Like, that's unfortunately what it is. It's pharmaceuticals and surgeries. And those are really important for some people and not as important for others. But it's definitely something that is necessary in our communities. However, that doesn't make them the end-all be-all of optimal health. We like to say, and you've heard me say it before if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, that the U.S. healthcare is actually sick care. Healthcare is something you have to invest in on your own, whether it's lifestyle habits and things that you do every day to take care of yourself better, or money you spend on better quality testing through functional medicine doctors or naturopathic doctors, etc. Because you have to have a dual-parted or multi-parted healthcare team that has multiple people that are experts in each part of their field. So Having people in like chiropractic, physical therapy, or personal training that you trust are great for everything body movement. Injuries, imbalances, lack of strength, trying to build strength, those are all those people for that. Anything to do with acute injury, like a bad one, like a broken leg and stuff, is like surgeons and such, you know, and or your PCP, your general practitioner. They are the people you go to when you're like, I think I have a bacterial infection, I've got stuff throat, um, I have a 104 fever, you know, very acute health things, you tend to go to the emergency room or these doctors to get prescriptions for things that are necessary with modern medical care. They also can take general markers, but honestly, they do a piss poor job of it because I've had so many clients go to doctors looking for help with this or that. And they'll usually call them not very nice names, um, say that they just need to lose weight 
and not give them much more tools and say like, follow the Mediterranean diet. And then like, like easily 50 of my clients over the years have just said, my doctor said I need to follow the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> and the Mediterranean diet now has been manipulated in a direction that is actually not the true Mediterranean diet, which is scarier because now it's being funded more by grain, <laughs> big grain and a lot of plant-based stuff, which is nothing wrong entirely for general population with following a more plant-based diet. However, you do still need a solid amount of complete proteins, typically from animal sources, because they are the most nutrient dense and they are the way your body knows how to absorb those nutrients. Our bodies cannot always absorb everything from plants, unfortunately, because historically for the longevity of our entire life, we've always involved animal products in our food. It doesn't mean we only ate animal products, but it does mean that our body got good at absorbing its most necessary essential nutrients aka micronutrients, from animal products, including animal proteins. So this is, and that's non-arguable. You know, there's a lot of kind of weird propaganda going around right now, but it's important to understand that that is just legitimately a thing. Um, I've seen a lot of vegan and vegetarian clients have fertility again, better hair again, finally lose weight, all because they incorporated animal products back into their life after years of not eating it. And there's a way you can do that sustainably. So if you're somebody who's been teetering on that and wondering why your health is going to shit, you might want to involve that or, or consider it rather. But with that said, it's hard to trust a lot of Western medicine education because they have a lot of capitalistic intentions <laughs> funding behind them. And that's where it gets a little bit shifty. It is very important to know that a lot of times people who are like food scientists or PhDs in fitness or whatever, they could lack some depth in real life experience. And they might just be kind of spewing what literature says. But as a lot of us know, who've been working in the field, quote unquote, for a while, you know that not everything in literature matches up with real life situations. So you kind of have to check and make sure, again, whether or not they have red flags like spammy content or affiliates, because New York Times put out an article a few years ago talking about kind of unveiling the smoke and mirrors behind a lot of these people with PhDs or dietitians and such, saying that, yes, they did get paid by big corporate food corporations and big pharma to push unhealthy sugar-laden foods uh, for money. And some of them were just like, you know, at the time I didn't realize that this was that harmful to say, and I needed it, the money for my livelihood. And so a lot of people, unfortunately, will do anything to do that because like existing the last few years has been very challenging economically. <laughs> I get it. But at the same time, it sucks because then it makes these people that you think are the utmost credible people, unfortunately, less credible because now they're just pushing what pays them. That's important to talk about. I know it's kind of icky and I know that it's like probably questionable, but I do want you to maybe open this opportunity to research it a little bit for yourself or see some more things. Try to search like an unbiased source <laughs> to kind of find out a little bit more because then it'll help you better understand that not everything that ends with an MD, PhD, dietitian, etc. means that they are super credible or experienced. taking a quick break from the episode today to do our newest section of the podcast where I answer Q&As from listeners. And this question is from Alicia and she asked, what diet style is the best for fat loss? Oh my gosh, this is such a big question. So I'm going to try to keep this really condensed and perhaps I will make a longer podcast on this question in the future, but it's a really great question, especially in the new year. I'm sure a lot of people are trying to figure that out for themselves. And so my first questions are first kind of looking at how much activity do you plan to do while you're in this fat loss phase. So again, like I've said many times in past episodes, you need to make sure that you're planning a phase, aka a set amount of weeks or months that you're going to be doing a fat loss situation. Because if you open-endedly think about fat loss for the entire year, you're most likely going to fail or not see much progress or have a lot of challenges. Versus I usually recommend people do maximum 10 to 15 weeks of a fat loss phase, aka putting their body into a deficit situation. And then once they start to kind of hit a plateau, you take a diet break 
for a few weeks to several months, and then you do another phase. This is also helpful because it helps you stick to your dieting phase, no matter what eating style or fitness style you choose for a better adherence for a shorter term of time. So that would be kind of my first tip is think about that first. Think of which months or weeks you want to plan to be in this specific situation, and then you can pick which eating style and or increase in fitness or classes or whatever you want to combine to impact your energy deficit. So both things that you can manipulate your calories in and calories out with is through your nutrition and your fitness. So first, I like to ask like, how much exercise do you plan to increase or do? Because some people have goals to build muscle and lean out. So you're going to need to do more exercise intensity. You're going to need to build muscle, which means you need carbs for recovery, which means that a low carb diet is not ideal for you if that is the goal you want. If you want to do a body recomp, we call it, which is recomposition, aka losing fat, gaining muscle, you're going to need to eat carbs because carbs are glycolytic, aka glycogen, aka sugars, aka carbs in your body and your muscles rebuild themselves on carbs. So you need to be doing an eating style that involves carbs. You can absolutely do a really good recomp and make fat loss happen while eating carbs. 100% you can. So if you have enough space in your weekly plan to fit in like three to five strength training sessions a week or classes that involve strength training and cardio, you definitely need enough carbs. So I would recommend a mixed diet, mixed plate diet, aka omnivore, where you have enough good quality, complete proteins, good quality, healthy fats, and fiber, and good quality carb sources, natural carb sources. Again, if you want to use my resource that I have for free for you guys to break down macronutrients and help you build a grocery list that supports a healthier lifestyle, whether or not you're trying to lose fat, you can go to my stand store, standout store, backslash kales, K-A-I-L-E-S. You can also download it from my website, coachkales.com, full free. It's all for free. It's up there for you. So that would be my best tip for people who want to build muscle and lose fat and stay good energy and they have enough space in their lifestyle to do that. If you're a person who has a really busy life or past injuries or just plain old doesn't like weightlifting or doesn't have access to a gym and you can only do like some walking, I would definitely say for your exercise portion, increase your what's called NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is your day-to-day movement. So walking to and from the grocery store, park farther, walking up and down the stairs or taking the elevator, take the stairs, you know, all those little things actually do add up and they make a big impact on your day-to-day energy as well as how much energy you burn throughout your day. And maybe throw in a 15 to 30 or 45 minute walk at some point in your day or split it up or get one of those under your desk walking pads. Those are great ways to increase your movement, but your best diet style for fat loss in that sense could be following something that's more like a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet or a lower carb diet. So those are all ones where you're not able to put out a lot of energy. So you don't need the quick energy that carbs provide you. You might do really well on a low carb keto or carnivore diet. You need to make sure you're eating enough calories though. And you need to make sure that you're having a good amount of satiating nutrients and extra nutrients like a good quality daily vitamin like pure encapsulations or vital nutrients or designs for health those all are great companies that i trust that you can find a good quality multivitamin from that you should definitely be taking on those types of diets because they tend to remove a lot of like vegetables and fruits and things and sometimes even just nutrients that you can get from grains or beans or whatever So you definitely want to just stay on top of that if you do that. And again, only for 10 to 15 weeks, see how you do, okay? I've had clients do a really good job with that if they're somebody who cannot get in the gym as frequently. And then the last part that I'll say is if you do have challenges with specific eating disorders, like binging, or um, you just have a lot of food noise, aka like you're constantly thinking about food, you may do really well on what's called a a carnivore diet. And a lot of people might be really surprised that I'm even talking about this because I've had a very changed position on understanding this as a intervention. It's a nutritional intervention. It's not always a long-term lifestyle of eating, especially for my females who are premenopausal. So anybody who's still ovulating, bleeding, all that stuff, 
I don't always recommend a lifetime of keto or a lifetime of carnivore. Frankly, I don't recommend also like a, a lifetime of processed carbs either, you know, or a lifetime of veganism. I don't recommend any of those things because they can all come with their own issues long term. But intervention wise, if you're really like trying to curb the cravings, like the food noise and all that stuff, carnivore is actually a very successful way for you to take that out because it is really hard to overeat protein. It's really hard to get the blood sugar spikes when you have only balancing nutrients like quality fats and animal proteins. So if you are somebody who is trying to improve that and can also does not have the opportunity to exercise intensely or any of that stuff and just wants to do walking and stretching and yoga or whatever, you might be a good candidate for something that's more like a carnivore-based diet. It doesn't have to be just meat and salt water. You can also involve some fruits and some honey or nuts. You know, those are some versions of it. There's a lot of different versions out there, so research it for yourself. But of course, like I always say, definitely check with your wellness providers first that you are a good candidate for it and or make sure you do your good research from doctors or practitioners that are well-researched in these different diet styles. But if I had to give you my best top tips real quick on which diet style is best for fat loss, that is exactly what I'd say. So I hope that all of that was very helpful for you, Alicia, <laughs> and everybody else listening. Back to the episode. But if you have questions for me and you want to be answered on a future podcast, shoot me a DM on any of my Instagrams, or you can email me hello at kaylearn.com and just ask your question and I will answer it. All right, back to the show. Concept number five is the manipulation of scientific studies. This is really, really, really key because most general population who didn't go to school or have any specific background in nutrition or fitness doesn't know. They probably have no idea how scientific studies are published. Generally, we like to believe that if a scientific study is published, then it must be the utmost of truth. But it is unfortunately not always right. There is a laundry list of reasons that many scientific studies are half-assed or manipulated. Unfortunately, there's a lot of corporations who fund most studies because studies are expensive, scientists are expensive, and the depth of a study, the length of it means it's more money. And nobody, like no average Joe is like, I'd really like to know whether or not red meat actually causes heart disease, like they say, from the viewpoint of just steaks and things like non-adulterated beef. <laughs> Nobody's going to fund that on their own because they don't want people to know that that is a nuanced scenario for red meat. They, this, all the studies of red meat, legitimately guys, why I changed my opinion on it as I became a more well-seasoned nutritionist is I started to look up all these studies that the CDC based everything on. And there's a, a lot of confounding variables. So that means things that they didn't bother looking into. Like, what was this person's lifestyle like? What else were they eating? They probably were eating a lot of processed red meat, like bacon with nitrates. And we do already know for a fact that nitrates are a leading cause to cancer if you consume them too frequently. And you also don't know, like, were they drinking a bunch of Coke and Pepsi and other things? Like, those are confounding variables. Those are examples. So all I said is this person ate red meat. They checked on the box of the survey <laughs> that they did this and we followed their blood markers and health and a lot of them ended up with heart disease. Okay, well, take somebody who ate only beef for a long period of time and does their and drank water, maybe had coffee or tea and maybe some vegetables here and there. Like do they also have the same health markers as the other people? No. We're actually finding that now with a lot of specific experiences with people who are in real life, aka like keto and carnivore, and now it's completely flipping this whole red meat is bad for you on its head. And I have to talk about this a lot to my clients because it's really important to be critical of understanding where your health goes because of what, you know, if you are consuming a lot of saturated fats and processed foods, you're getting a lot more chemicals and not easily to recognize food particles into your stomach. And that inevitably will always cause inflammation and or issues with your health due to a lot of 
bad things that your body isn't used to in it and hanging out in it, not detoxing properly, especially if you drink alcohol frequently because your liver is burdened or you're taking birth control, like oral contraceptives and things because those fake hormones burden your liver as well. You know, there's so much that could go really deep into that. But if you don't understand that it's not specifically just one food item, especially not a natural food item that humans have been eating for a long time, not specifically just beef, but red meat in general, and that includes lamb, goat, I believe, and several other things. I mean, pork is pink. A lot of people do and do not eat pork, but those are all things that like the body's been eating for a long time. So it can recognize it. It can pull a lot of really good nutrients from it because beef is one of the best sources of so many things more than just iron. And we forget that it's usually because we're eating it in, with con- in conjunction with other foods like processed muffins, cookies, chips, sodas, super sugary teas, you know, just lots of carbs. Because when carbs bind with the saturated fats or other unhealthy fats, it's typically those that combination that causes higher cholesterol, clogging arteries, you know, all that jack, jack all that jack, pretty much. The thing that sucks about manipulation of scientific studies is that this is commonly used a lot (laughs) and only people who take the time to look past more than just the title and the summary and observe it and see like what are potential massively influential confounding variables that they didn't address or maybe they did address in the study but they didn't say it in the actual presentation online of what the results were but it's going to be hard (laughs) For you to not know that this could be completely wrong because it is not uncommon for a lot of scientific studies to be shifted by the corporations who funded it to support their cause or the result that they want. So they will remove entire like outliers of results to make the curve of the results better. This is a real thing. And it's sketchy, especially for like a multitude of things. They recently did one on that topic, like I was just talking about, when you combine certain macronutrients, like carbs plus high fat or high protein, or not really high protein, but high fat and protein is involved. So if let's say you ate a muffin and a fatty steak versus just a muffin and a bowl of veggies, of course, you're going to have negative results from the higher calorie steak with fat and muffin and because of a multitude of things but the fact that the carbs are combined with the fats is where we see the issue of inflammation and cloggy arteries all that junk and i'm just kind of using layman terms for you guys right now so if you're somebody who has more scientific background and you're like i don't know if that's the right way to say that that's just the closest way to kind of say it in a better understandable way so then there was a study where basically recently (laughs) it's so stupid They were trying to prove that like there's a lot of argument right now how plant oils are not good for you and saturated fat is good for you. Again, if you don't have a nutrition background or understand the science of that, of macronutrients, you would understand that those are not really good things to compare to each other because they are kind of very different and how you eat them is different, is how it's going to impact you. So they did basically plant-based oils and saturated fat oils and they had the people consume them and then tested their blood and washed their markers as they processed the food. What they left out is that they baked those oils into muffins. So they baked them into processed carbs. So of course the canola oil based with the processed carbs isn't going to have quite the same reaction as saturated fat with processed carbs. Like I just said, when you put a fat like saturated fat with a carb that's when we see a lot of health problems for people. That's why a lot of people have changed their health with like carnivore diet and keto diet and stuff like that. I've personally seen it myself because I've put several clients on nutritional interventions with keto diet specifically, and their health markers improved insanely compared to a standard American diet where they had a mixed diet of carbs, fats, proteins, and alcohol and stuff like that. Once they went keto, and ate tons of saturated fat and fat in general, and tons of red meat and other things like that, their health markers improved massively. And that's exactly what's pointing towards the science behind the combination of macronutrients matters. So anyways, all that to say, this study had kind of a stupid (laughs) execution in, in a lot of our opinions from the nutrition side, where it doesn't make sense to do something like that, because you're 
putting too many variables in. So a confounding variable for that, for example, would be that it was combined with carbs. It was in a freaking muffin. How about you compare <laughs> straight up a plant seed oil laden salad or something like with the same grams of oil in a steak or something and then consume that and see how the body reacts on its own. And then you'd have to make sure that those people were not eating other processed carbs at the same time because we do already know from scientific fact that it matters what you combine the macronutrients with as how they affect your body. So hopefully that's not too confusing for you, but that is a recent study that came out that is supposedly supporting plant seed oils. And unfortunately it is biased and it is not a very accurate study. Like in my mind, I completely throw that entire study out because I'm like, yeah, but we already know that you freaking put them in muffins. <laughs> like that's stupid. <laughs> but a very well-renowned PhD in nutrition guy that I follow, I won't say his name, but he unfortunately is like totally spreading the BS on this because he's got a huge ego and he really wants to support his claims. And <laughs> he's just like, I will fight anyone on this anytime. This is the way it is. Seed oils are not that bad for you, you know, la la la. Um, and I'm like... <laughs> Okay, but you you should know more than anyone that there's nuance to that. There's a lot of nuance to that. And it's making a lot of people confused because they tout him as a big expert, you know, in it, which he is. But in this sense, he's really going by a very limited viewpoint, like a very narrow look. And it is pretty disappointing, honestly. But the way for you guys, the way I look at that is I don't write him off entirely. I just write that off because now I know that information is not always true. And so for me, I pick and choose what I actually listen to from him. And that's something that you guys can do when you're on social media is look at those things. And the more you start to better understand a topic, maybe you follow several people who are sharing their thoughts on it, gather all those thoughts, see what you think is the common truth and probably follow that. Again, I say probably because unfortunately a lot of people will say the same ass thing and it's overall not true, and then it gets debunked or whatever. So unfortunately, it's a little bit tricky. It's a little tricky pickle sometimes, but I hope that that is a little bit helpful for you guys so that you can kind of better see that unfortunately a lot of people with like PhD and stuff in their name follow the results of manipulated scientific studies, and that's not great. And I know that you probably are like, okay, but in the beginning, I thought we were talking about people who have professional education. Um, but yes, but this is, this is where I'm telling you the nuance of that, because you can't just simply follow health people that have PhD or MD or certified nutritionist or dietitian on their um, names, because sometimes too, they are not always the end all be all of education. Concept number six, there is a lot of misleading advice that have kind of narrow or inaccurate basis. And you'll get it from like a lot of a lot of every, a lot of everybody that I just spoke about. And you have to be a little bit careful about how much stock you put in these professionals because it can just make you more and more confused. And I think that that is what I see the most with a lot of my friends, family, and clients who follow like a lot of health talk or nutrition people or fitness people on Instagram, et cetera, because there's just really short videos, like seven seconds of some half truth or complete BS thing that somebody says. And then because that person's wearing like a medical scrub, scrubs rather, um, and things like that, they're like, oh, this must be true. They look like they know what they're talking about. But again, <laughs> a lot of Western medically trained people don't actually go through that much specific nutritional science unless they specifically go into private practice for themselves and they want to do better for people in that zone, or they do spend extra time going into a niche in the medical world that does specialize in nutritional science. So that's where the qualifiers come in. So kind of going back to that credentials and such, um, the concept number seven is the importance of qualifiers that you definitely need to make sure that there is qualifications and just perform some quick research on like suspicious seeming claims or controversial claims, you know, and it's, it's not easy to sift through. I know that. Um, and I think that that's really tough because you research something and people can pay for 
what's called SEO, search engine optimization, if you don't know what that is. And they can pay Google or any other search thing to put them higher on the list to seem like it is the more credible resource. And that's what sucks because a lot of these big food corporations will pay for a lot more blog things to pop up higher that support their claims and doesn't support the alternative viewpoint or experience. So it's, it's, it is tricky. It is tricky. I know, I know, but it is something that it is always important for you to get in the habit to be a critical thinker and kind of only take things with a grain of salt, unless you find it to be true for you as well. So if you do practice whatever they say and you don't feel better or you gained more weight or this didn't happen or that didn't happen, maybe it's probably a little bit of baloney or an anecdotal experience that that person had and is not right for you. So then make your health decisions to towards whatever you feel like the result of whatever you followed was. But honestly, discussing your health decisions with like your professional health care team is way more important. So I like a lot of my clients default to asking me things because of that. They default to me because they know that uh, this is my world. I can usually sift through the BS a lot faster. So it is important for you to consider having like a professional nutritionist or health coach or fitness personal trainer or something that is experienced to bounce things off of <laughs> to find out if you have a friend or something like that reach out to them. I'm sure they don't mind you asking, or they'll probably tell you by either saying, Hey, don't keep asking me about this stuff or whatever for free, (laughs) or they'll just not respond to you, whatever, but it's worth trying, you know, because they're a good resource for you for trying to figure that out. All right. The final, the final concept that I want you to really highly consider today as we close out this chat is you gotta cut down the noise. So I definitely recommend you limit the number of health voices that you follow on social media so that you can avoid the information overload and therefore confusion. There is so many negative impacts of excessive information when you're consuming a ton of like health social media tips because there's a lot of different overlapping advice. There's advice that is alternative to the other side. It's going to leave you confused. It probably is leaving you confused and it's not worth it. So it can make all of this talk a lot easier for you. If you're thinking about like, I don't know how I can like make better choices on who I follow for health stuff because everything that Kales is saying is like, follow somebody who's qualified, but it's also a little bit hard to know if they're still educationally beneficial to follow, (laughs) which I get. I totally get. As I wrote this entire podcast out, I was like, hmm, This is tough because it is a little bit complicated. But again, this this entire thing is a lot of health advice is in a gray area. It's not always super black and white. And so picking what I would say is the easiest thing that you can do or more simple is find at least five to 10 max people that you already follow that you sift through and you do the, the different tips that I gave you above that were about how to check their qualifications and all that stuff and see if they don't have any of the red flags and yada, yada. Unfollow everyone who has those red flags because you're probably not missing out on much, honestly, especially people who have a lot of followers and have zero qualifications anywhere that you can find. Unfollow her. Sorry. (laughs) Just do it because it's not helping you. It's probably hurting you. And trust me, even if some of what she's saying is true, there's a lot of stuff that could become confusing and wrong or very nuanced and they're just playing it out black and white and it's not real and it can just again make you have just too much consumption and you won't remember your foundational health things that are important to fall back on every time you get confused with all this like extra extra sauce we'll call it (laughs) you just need your major proteins don't need all the sauce all the time (laughs) so cut it down to like five to ten health voices and make sure that you don't scroll health talk or health uh, reels and whatnot too much. And the moment you start to get a little confused or whatever, that's probably the right time to stop scrolling (laughs) and just save your mental health because it is such a overstimulated and oversaturated market out there right now that me as a long-term professional in both nutrition and fitness, I just have such a hard time being like, oh my gosh, this is so misleading, (laughs) or this is really dangerous for a lot of people to follow, or maybe this is kind of true, but at the same time, they presented it kind of aggressive. 
I'm gonna leave you guys with a reminder. Just, it is so important to be a critical consumer of wellness information on social media. It is gonna be kind of a make it or break it for your health because it's almost in a way that can cause like yo-yo dieting for you mentally because you're not gonna know what to follow this or that and yada yada. You gotta stay mindful of the information that people tell you to do and whether or not you implement it because it's better to prioritize your own well-being versus see if it's prioritizing their income. <laughs> Be very careful about a lot of that and make sure that you don't fall for like scammy things or hyped up courses and programs and stuff like that that are promising really lofty things like lose 20 pounds in four weeks. Even 20 pounds in 10 weeks is pretty aggressive. It's It can be possible, usually more for the male body than the female body, but it, again, depends body to body. This is where everything's gray, guys. Uh, but I do just want to remind you that just stay as mindful as you can of the information that you implement into your well-being. And it's just very, very valuable for you to follow trustworthy sources and just cut out those that just do not serve your wellness journey anymore, okay? I think that is the best thing that I can leave you with from this chat today. All right, Rebels, so that is it for today's episode. Share this with somebody you think could benefit from this conversation. I'm gonna say it's more of a conversation than like a end-all be-all of this topic because it is very much something I want to empower you with information to do better and help others do better with the wellness world because it is definitely an oversaturated space and a very confusing space. So if you know somebody who is constantly overstimulated by these topics, definitely send it their way. But I would love if you feel so called to give the show a five-star rating so we can grow and get in front of more people and help more women do better in their life and their health in general. But as always, celebrate your strength and nourishment, walk with confidence, and I'll catch you next week on another episode of Rebel Wholeness. still listening thank you for tuning in to our latest episode of rebel wellness if you've been enjoying our conversations around health fitness and wellness i have some exciting news for you so if you would love to join our newsletter group you can join us on coachkales.com or you can join my stan store at stan.store backslash kales k-a-i-l-e-s and that's an awesome opportunity for you to snag some freebies that i've created including a macro hack grocery list that is going to help you kind of design a custom grocery list especially for following macronutrients because as you know if you didn't listen to my macros in may series i would go back to those episodes because it has been a game changer for so many of our listeners for getting more on top of how to shape their physique and their health goals with the food they're eating. So don't sleep on that. Go get your free download, S-T-A-N, like Stan the man, stan.store backslash kills. And you can also join our newsletter from that. And if you would like to reach out to me, chat, maybe work together, you can also contact me through my website, coachkales.com. And I would absolutely love you to join our Rebel Wellness Podcast Instagram, which is at Rebel Wellness Podcast. And you can also join my flagship coaching page at Coach by Kales. That's where it all began. That's where I share the most um, kind of custom to what I work on specifically with my clients on that page. So join that one. It's all feminine wellness focused. And I share some great stuff, some goofy stuff, things that you just don't want to miss, as well as healthy recipes and things and easy recipes, because we all kind of need some easy grab and go things, don't we? So I would love you to join both those pages as you'll be joining a community of like-minded females who are all committed to living their best lives. So hit that follow button. And I would love if you felt the need to share and rate our podcast. We would love that. Anyways, thanks for listening. And I hope to catch you next Sunday or say hello on the gram.